Section 12 of Bismarck by Georges Lacour Gaillet, translated by M. Harriet M. Capes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 6 Last Fights, Part 2. On the anniversary of the Crown Prince's birth in 1877, someone reminded Bismarck that it would be the proper thing to send him a congratulatory telegram. Yes, of course, he answered, it must be sent for form's sake. Ah, if it was his mother! No fear of my sending that woman one, even for form's sake. The emperor being ill, the empress spent almost all her time with him, which exasperated Bismarck. And that's love, is it? Nonsense. It's pure comedy, conventional affection. There's nothing natural about that woman. She's as artificial inside as out. The emperor was not ignorant of the reciprocal hostility of his chancellor and the empress. But his affection for his wife, a deep affection, made up of courtesy and respect, did not prevent his recognition of all he owed to Bismarck or his giving him his entire confidence. These two men were bound to understand each other. One was the absolute king of Prussia, completely and totally king of Prussia, the Stock Preussenkönig. The other, at any period of his career and through all his political evolutions, had always been the champion of downright Prussianism. During this long space of time, I have seen many friends become enemies. The confidence and favor of your majesty have alone remained unalterable. It is in that that I find the most glorious reward of my toil and the greatest consolation for my pains. I love my two countries, the German country as well as the Prussian country, but I could not have cheerfully served them both if I had not had the satisfaction of my king to encourage me. Saint-Simon wrote a striking passage on the relations of Louis the Thirteenth and Richelieu. It might almost be reproduced to fit those of William the First and Bismarck, taking heed not only of times and personages, but especially of the difference between policy à la Française and German policy, let us borrow just a few lines from the author of the Parallèle des Trois Premiers Rois Bourbon. The transposition will speak for itself. I do not mean, he said, that I wish to deny that the cardinal was in many respects the greatest man the last centuries have produced, but it is no less true that not one of the great things done in his day was done but after being discussed between the king and Richelieu in the most profound secrecy. Therefore one cannot in justice deprive Louis of a great part in all great things that were conceived and executed during his reign, though at the same time it was impossible that the fame for them should not be assigned to Richelieu then and remain his ever since. Bismarck praised two of his master's qualifications, his attention to business and the rectitude of his judgment. His zeal, he said, was due to the high sense he had of his obligations, to the accomplishment of his duty as a sovereign. He brought a far from usual amount of good sense, not supported by understanding, no doubt, but also in no way distorted. William's good sense had led him to discover Bismarck to hold to him despite his enemies, and to keep him till the end. Undazzled by his character or his fame, he allowed him to manage things because he had always recognized that he was the man of his own policy. William I died on the 9th of March, 1888, in his 92nd year. On the eve of his death, he had a long talk with Bismarck. He told him he relied on him, that he must remain in office and faithfully serve his successors. 
he exacted a promise from him to help his grandson with his experience, and if he were called to reign, to keep loyally beside him. At one moment in the weakening of his mind, he took the Chancellor for his grandson, Prince William, and said familiarly, you must always keep up good relations with the Emperor of Russia. There's no need to argue about that. We know how the grandson was to keep on good terms with Russia and the Emperor of Russia. When on the morrow Bismarck announced in the Reichstag the death of the sovereign, whose collaborator and adviser he had been for twenty-six years, his voice broke with emotion. The new reign began under the saddest of auspices. The crown prince Frederick William, who began his reign at the age of fifty-five, had been for some months suffering from a cancer in the larynx which could have nothing but a fatal end. After an operation he had completely lost the power of speech. Nevertheless, devoted to duty before all else, he was not willing to withdraw from the obligations of his birth. He, with his wife, left the villa at San Remo where he was dying. The reign of Frederick III was to last scarcely three months, three months of uninterrupted agony. The relations of Bismarck and the Crown Prince Frederick had often been strained. One was a man of authority with rough manners, the other a liberal and a prince who liked to please. Bismarck partly extended the antipathy he had for his wife to the Crown Prince himself. The great fault of the daughter of Prince Albert and Queen Victoria was that she was English, that is to say, liberal. The Chancellor called her the English woman, the disciple of Gladstone, and according to him, she did nothing but propagate English influence and serve the interests of England. She had never ceased to look upon England as her country. She had shed tears over the annexation of Schleswig and Hanover. She had much more influence over her husband than was desirable. She was always trying to indoctrinate him with her ideas and Bismarck always came back to the unpardonable crime. She was English, and he detested England with all the force of his Prussian hate. One day, toward the end of the siege of Paris, in a familiar talk, he gave free vent to his sentiments about England and the crown princess Victoria. No, this is too much, he exclaimed. Those English have unheard of pretensions. Would you believe that now they want to send a gunboat up the Seine to look for the English families that have remained in Paris? I know all about that. What they really want is to find out if we have sunk torpedoes, so that the French vessels may afterwards go up the river behind them. They can't endure little Prussia increasing in such a way. Prussians exist for them only as long as they can use them as mercenaries. I'm sure of it. It's what all the higher classes in England think. They've never known us, and have always done everything they could to injure us. The Princess Royal is the incarnation of what I'm telling you. She is full of the condescension she showed in deigning to marry into this country. The new emperor and his wife, deeply attached to each other and both of noble character, were willing to forget, in the interest of the empire, the rough speeches of a minister who was puffed up with his own importance, but indispensable. Nothing was changed in the official position of the chancellor. On taking the title of emperor and king, Frederick III published a manifesto in which he praised the faithful and courageous adviser who gave form to the political plans of the great emperor and assured their success, and he was declared indispensable to the country. The only notable event of this three months' reign was a dispute between the Empress Victoria and the Chancellor, in which the Emperor decided in favor of the Chancellor. 
already in the reign of William I there had been talk of a marriage between the Princess Victoria of Prussia and Prince Alexander of Battenberg. This was the prince who in 1879 had become Prince of Bulgaria, and to whom, on his starting for Sophia, Bismarck had made this prophetically ironic speech, It will give you some pleasant memories. Princess Victoria was the daughter of the Crown Prince Frederick, and her brother William had called her one day a goose and a turkey hen because she boasted of the superiority of English life. A romantic love was born between the two young people. Bismarck flatly declared that the marriage was impossible. It would embroil the Hohenzollerns with the Romanovs because of the bad relations of Battenberg with Alexander III. The real reason may have been that it did not displease Bismarck to make himself disagreeable to the Englishwoman. The crown prince became emperor, and the mother and daughter believed that the marriage plan might be taken up again, all the more easily because Battenberg was no longer prince of Bulgaria. In intimate talk, Bismarck spoke very cavalierly of the Battenbergerin, as he called her. It's true, he said, that Prince Alexander is a handsome man. He has a magnificent carriage, but she'll accommodate herself to any other wooer as long as he looks like a man. As soon as there was a question for the second time of the marriage, in April 1888, he once more declared that the thing was impossible, always because of Russia. As for him, he would prefer to resign. Frederick III, like his father, did not give his consent to the marriage. But the unhappy emperor did not fear displeasing his chancellor. He obliged the Home Secretary Putkammer, a creature of Bismarck's, to resign because of the indifference with which he managed electoral matters. This energetic action preceded his death by seven days. Some hours before he died, he took the hand of the empress and put it into that of the chancellor as a sign of reconciliation. On the 15th of June, the martyrdom of Frederick III came to an end. The new emperor king, William II was a man of twenty-nine, nervous, of an exuberant disposition, and very anxious to make himself known. He did not conceal his admiration for his grandfather's policy and for the minister who had managed it. Quite recently, he had expressed his feelings for Bismarck in a resounding fashion. On the 1st of April, the Chancellor's birthday, he had come in person to the Wilhelmstrasse to give him his good wishes and had invited himself to dinner. At the end of the meal, he proposed a toast which contained a very unkind allusion to the approaching death of the emperor his father, but which did not surprise those who knew that he detested his parents. The empire, he said, glass in hand, is like an army corps which has lost its principal general on the field of battle and sees its own commander seriously wounded. In so critical a situation, the hearts of forty-six millions of Germans can but turn with hope to the standard and the standard-bearer to whom they have given all their confidence. The standard-bearer is our illustrious, our great chancellor, let him lead us, we will follow him, long may he live. On the 25th of June, the tenth day of his reign, William had read his first speech from the throne in the Reichstag, and at the end of it he had held out his hand to Bismarck with a theatrical gesture, as if to invest him before the assembly with his imperial and royal favor. The old chancellor of seventy-three and the young emperor of twenty-nine entirely pleased with each other, were in perfect agreement. At that time, a polemical matter was making a great noise. It had to do with the posthumous publication of the diary of the Emperor Frederick in 1870 and 1871, 
in which the conduct of Bismarck at that period was often severely judged. The Chancellor, whose pride was ungovernable and who thought he guessed this publication to be a piece of revenge of the English woman, fretted and fumed. We'll begin by saying it is a forgery, he said. Personally, I feel more sure even than you do of the authenticity of the diary, but that doesn't matter. It must be treated as a forgery. The calumny did no good, and then Bismarck had an action brought for violation of state secrets, but the action ended in the acquittal of the accused, a professor at the Strasbourg University. This affair, a scandal which put the Chancellor to confusion, made no alteration in his relations with William II. He spoke of him with tenderness, as in this confidential talk dated the 27th of September, 1888. He shows me great consideration. You remember how attentive and obliging he was the last time he came here, Friedrich's Rue. In the evening, he was astonished that I had waited till eleven o'clock for him and had not gone to bed. Ah, his grandfather would never have said a thing like that. And in the morning, it was he who waited for me. Contrary to all his habits, he got up at nine o'clock because he thought I always slept till that hour. He came into my room while I was washing half undressed. He laid his hand prettily on my shoulder, and I had hastily to put on my dressing gown so as to receive him properly. You have a docile and grateful pupil who keeps you in your duties as statesman. Yes, there is scarcely anything in him to find fault with, but matters of no importance. For example, the style of some of his speeches. He makes use of new words that he has picked up from newspapers. But that's just the vivacity of youth, and he'll correct it in time. It's better to have too much spirit than not enough. It was not long before Bismarck discovered that the verbose young emperor, always helmeted and spurred, had a great deal too much spirit. The Tsar, Alexander III, had come to Berlin at the end of October, 1889. The Chancellor had a long talk with him, trying to convince him that the Triple Alliance was the best guarantee of peace in Europe. Yes, I believe you, answered Alexander, and I have confidence in you. But are you sure you will remain in office? Certainly, Your Majesty. I am absolutely certain to remain minister all my life. Five months later, Bismarck had vacated his office. The Chancellor had always had a wonderful insight into men and things. He had always been able to guess at any danger which might threaten his position or his policy, and had consequently guarded against it. It will be remembered how von Arnhem had learnt this to his cost. But was his perspicacity beginning to weaken with age, or was it rather his inordinate pride and his overweening belief in his own genius and infallibility, which prevented his having any idea that the time was coming when his services would be held useless and even disagreeable? He had no suspicion that the new emperor would not have the patience of Louis the Fourteenth, who had felt able to wait for the death of Mazarin, and that he would not shrink from an act of authority or even brutality to convince Germany and the world that the empire had but one master, himself. Unaware of the storm which was brewing against him and which was to break out, with the suddenness and force of a thunderbolt, Bismarck, in 1889, had retired to his estate at Friedrichsruhe to spend there the autumn and winter, taking up once more the country gentleman life which he loved above all else. He kept touch with politics, but from afar, and without the uninterrupted obsession that beset him in the Wilhelmstrasse. Suddenly, at the end of January, 1890, 
a telegram from his son, Count Herbert, Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, recalled him to Berlin. Some weeks earlier, a strike had broken out among the miners of the Rhine Valley. This was a fine opportunity for the young emperor, who thought himself fitted for everything, to settle the social question once for all. He had received in person the workmen's delegates and had said to them, My ears will always be open to just claims, but if you move, I'll have the lot of you fired on. Leaving this forcible style aside for the moment, he laid before the Crown Council the plan of an inquiry into the condition of factory workers so as to ensure by legislative measures the health, the morality, and the economic needs of the workmen. Bismarck strongly opposed this idea, for he was hostile to any state intervention in that kind of matter. To guard against the move, or to delay its results, he proposed to the emperor the calling together of an international conference. If Germany, in fact, were alone in regulating the duration of work, she would find herself beaten by foreign competition. William accepted the idea of this conference. On the 24th of February, 1890, an imperial rescript ordered the opening of negotiations with France, England, Belgium, and Switzerland with regard to an international agreement on the possibility of satisfying the needs and wishes of the workmen. The rescript did not bear beside William's signature that of the Chancellor, it was the first time for twenty-seven years that an official document had not received Bismarck's countersign. There could be no doubt of the complete emancipation of the young Telemachus or of the coming disgrace of the old mentor. Bismarck attempted to win back the game. He reminded his master that an ordinance of Frederick William IV given in 1852, declared that no important document could be prepared without the actual participation of the President of the Council. The Emperor, as his only answer, spoke of repealing this ordinance, and meanwhile he asked the Chancellor for a written report on the question. While this was going on, on the 14th of March, Windhorst, the leader of the Center, paid Bismarck a visit. Elections had quite recently formed a new Reichstag, and the object of Windhorst's visit was no doubt to look into the situation as it affected the different parties and especially the center. William II knew of this visit. He believed that a political coalition was being plotted against him, and the very same day he sent the chief of his civil cabinet, Lucanus, to ask for explanations. To the envoy, Bismarck replied, Kindly tell His Majesty that I recognize in no one whatsoever the right to dictate to me the choice of persons who cross my threshold. The next day, the 15th of March, the two adversaries face to face played the great scene of the fifth act. William went in person to the Wilhelmstrasse at ten o'clock in the morning, without letting himself be announced. Bismarck was still in bed. He got up hastily. "'What do your negotiations with Windhorst mean?' asked the Emperor abruptly. Bismarck answered that he had negotiated nothing, and then with entire self-possession he added, "'I can allow of no supervision in my relations with the deputies,' and I grant to no one the right to give orders in my house. Not even when I give orders to you as a sovereign? Not even then. The orders of my emperor stop before the door of Princess Bismarck's drawing-room. Moreover, it is but to keep a promise made to the emperor, William I, that I have remained in the service of his grandson. If I am troublesome to your majesty... I am ready to resign. The same day, the international conference was opened in the Chancellor's Palace. On the 16th of March, 
Bismarck said to his faithful Bush, who could not believe his ears, I can't stop here any longer. The sooner I go, the better. I can't go on in this way. He goes so far as to want to know whom I receive, and he has spies who scrutinize those who come in and go out. He wrote this rescript on labor questions, because he has unlimited belief in himself, though he knows nothing whatever about business. The rescript can only do harm. I told him so, but he is much too arrogant to listen to me. During the morning of the 17th of March, General von Hanke, chief of the military cabinet, went to the chancellors. The emperor, he said, expects the resignation of the prince. He will be ready to receive it at two o'clock. Bismarck replied that his health would not allow him to go out that day. He wanted some time still for drawing up his deed of resignation. In the afternoon, he unbosomed himself again to Maurice Bush. Ah, things have progressed more quickly than I thought. At first I thought that he would be grateful to me if I still remained some years with him. But on the contrary, I perceived that his one idea, his one desire, was to get rid of me so that he might govern by himself with his own genius, his own glory. He has had enough of the old mentor. He wants more docile agents now. But as for me, I cannot make up my mind to bend the knee before him. I cannot make up my mind to lie under the table like a dog. He wants to break with Russia, and he hasn't the courage to ask the liberals for the increase of the army. I've had enough of court intrigues, enough of their insolence, enough of being spied upon. My retirement is absolute, final. I will not be responsible to crown my career for the blunders of a presumptuous and inexperienced mind. That same evening, William again had Bismarck asked for his resignation. A special donation was assured him. I don't doubt his majesty's goodness, answered the chancellor bitterly, but I have a career behind me that does not permit me to end with a tip, such as one gives to the postman on New Year's Day. At last, on the 18th of March, the Chancellor drew up his letter of resignation, which he did not send in till the 20th. He began by giving long explanations concerning the royal ordinance of the 8th of September, 1852. He could not admit for himself the capitis de minutio which would result from the revocation of this ordinance. After six long pages, he ended thus. If I may trust my impressions during the last weeks, and the communications made to be yesterday by the civil and military cabinets of your majesty, I feel persuaded that I enter into the views of your majesty in handing in my resignation, and I can therefore count with certainty on its acceptance. And last of all came this paragraph, The Parthian Arrow. It is already a year since I should have asked your majesty to relieve me of my office if I had not believed that your majesty wished still to profit by the experience and capacity of the faithful servant of your predecessors. Now I am sure that your majesty has no need of me, and I may retire from political life without fear that public opinion may think my decision too premature. Bismarck. The next day Bismarck received at his table the delegates of the Labour Conference. He was in very good spirits and had never eaten with better appetite. You see, Monsieur Jules Simon, a man cannot die until he has smoked a hundred thousand cigars and drunk five thousand bottles of champagne. I am delighted to hear it, Your Excellency, answered the French delegate, for then I have a long time still to live. On receipt of the longed-for letter, the Emperor offered Bismarck the title of Duke of Lauenburg. I humbly ask Your Majesty, he replied, to permit me, 
in the future to bear only the name and the title I have borne up to now. Public opinion heard of Bismarck's resignation with a feeling of amazement, but also of relief. For twenty-eight years he had weighed so heavily on men and things. Nevertheless, on the day of his departure from Berlin for Friedrich's Rue, he was accompanied to the station by an enormous crowd, cheering him and covering him with flowers. The fall was a hard one for this old fighter of seventy-five. He still felt enough force in himself to carry on the rough battle of which his ministry had consisted, to cope with the Reichstag as aforetimes with the Landtag, to preside over European conferences, to settle quarrels, and now there was nothing to do but to manage his estates. I shall have to saw wood, he said sadly, since I can no longer saw men. Outside the family intimacy, which he greatly enjoyed, his principal pleasure was in writing his thoughts and memories. It was the picture of him that he wished to leave to posterity, a picture faked as in all autobiographies, and all the more faked when the personage has played a greater part in the world stage. He had a newspaper at his service, the Hamburger Nachrichten, and in it he had his successor, General Caprivi, torn to pieces. At court they pretended not to see it, but the irritation on both sides was extreme. Today, when the pan-Germanist Germany of William II is possessed by the madness of greatness, the fever of extravagance, which for her, as for the sick seized with general paralysis, are the infallible symptoms of a fatal termination, it is truly curious to see the advice to his successors which Bismarck had published in the press. He was opposed to all fresh wars. By war nothing can be obtained, only what was gained can be lost. Germany ought to be supremely indifferent to Balkan politics. If Austria wishes to pursue private interests in the Balkans, she ought to seek support not in Germany, but from the countries that have interests in the East, England, France, Italy. The Balkans do not interest Germany. The Empire of the Seas and the Weltpolitik, questions into which William II cast himself headlong, were not matters for Germany. I think it unnecessary on the part of Germany to rival the French or English fleets. Still, we ought to be strong enough on the sea to be able to influence the second-rate powers which we cannot reach by land. We must guard against exaggerated economy in naval matters, but also we ought to distrust fantastic projects which would put us into collision with nations which are important to our position in Europe. Nothing could be more absolutely contrary to the interests of Germany than to engage in enterprises more or less daring and adventurous with the sole desire of putting our fingers into every dish and flattering the vanity of the nation or satisfying the ambitions of those who govern it. That these councils would one day prove so many prophecies was not suspected. But anyhow, for the mass of the German people, the fallen god became more and more the national hero. William II had the good sense to understand it. In 1895, on Bismarck's 80th birthday, he went in person to Friedrichsruh to offer the former chancellor a sword of honor, thus inaugurating the fetes which took the character of an apotheosis. But Bismarck could not lay down his arms. The visit to Paris in October 1896 of the Tsar Nicholas inspired the Hamburger Nachrichten with a very violent article against the policy which, little by little, had estranged Russia from Germany. Once more it was aimed at Caprivi, or rather at his successor Hohenlohe. 
but this was forgetting the Congress of Berlin, at which Bismarck himself had begun the work of estrangement. It was the last roar of the wounded lion. In spite of his strong constitution and grand look, the old man's health was declining. The death of his wife, which happened in October 1894, after 47 years of marriage, had been a grievous sorrow to him. He himself was tired of life. He died after a few hours' illness on the 30th of July, 1898, aged 83 years and four months. He had arranged his funeral beforehand so that it might bear a character of quietness and simplicity. I will not have official lies on my tomb, he had said. He had pointed out the spot in the park at Friedrichsruhe in which he wished to lie and had drawn up the epitaph to be read on his tomb, Bismarck, faithful servant of the Emperor William I. At Berlin, on one side of the Königsplatz, in front of the Palace of the Reichstag, Bismarck's monument, the work of Bega, has stood since 1901. It is colossal, as suits the man in the country. Among the allegorical groups that surround the pedestal, in a fine bronze, the artist has represented a giant blacksmith forging on an anvil an enormous sword. Such is properly the picture which history must keep of the Iron Chancellor. He is the man who forged Germany by repeated blows of the hammer. That he changed his home policy, that he began by being nothing but a country squire of frankly reactionary spirit, a Prussian of a narrow conservatism, to become one day the partisan of universal suffrage and the incarnation of the Germanic fatherland, that has its interest, but it is not what history will best remember. What history will above all remember is this. In 1862, when Bismarck took the presidency of the council, Prussia was an ill-constituted body with gaps among its members. She held only second rank among the German states. In 1866, Prussia had soldered its bits together into a block stretching from the Rhine to the Niemen, her supremacy assured in an incontestable fashion. On the other hand, in 1862, the Germanic Confederation was still the survival of the Congress of Vienna, an agglomeration of states existing only to be jealous of each other and to manifest their powerlessness. In 1871, the German Empire was a vigorous organism, well-tempered, held under a strong discipline by the chief who had put himself at its head, who had organized it and led it to effective action. How had these two things been done? It was a work of fire and blood, the result of three wars against Denmark, against Austria, against France. With regard to Austria and her allies, after the violent passage of arms of 1866, Bismarck was capable of showing wisdom and proof of relative moderation, for he reserved for his master the collaboration of a second and prepared for the return of some of the vanquished states to the German fatherland. With regard to Denmark in 1864 and France in 1871, he gave full license to his inherent brutality. The annexation of Holstein and Schleswig, the annexation of Alsace and Lorraine, were the result of two robberies. Denmark wept in silence over the loss of her children. France protested with all her force against the violence done her. What did it matter to the thief? Bismarck was not of these, who demand that their victims should kiss the hand that strikes them. He knew himself to be detested, hated, cursed, in Prussia, in Germany, in Europe, and gloried in it. In the Reichstag one day, the 16th of January, 1874, he said, I have numerous enemies, 
go from the garonne to begin in gascony to the vistula from the belt to the tiber look along the banks of our german rivers the oda and the rhine and you will own that i am the most cordially detested man of the day but of this hatred i feel a profound disdain in a telegram to van arnim on the twenty fourth of february eighteen seventy five a propos of france he applied to himself sulla's words we did not want the war but we are always ready to make war again when further presumptuous actions of france force us into it odorant dum metuant and his germany congratulates itself on inspiring the same sentiments as himself on the first of april nineteen seventeen on the one hundred and second anniversary of bismarck's birth a professor beyond the rhine exclaimed we are the most detested people in the world and we ought to be proud of it to bismarck and to the germany of our days the old song luther's mother sang to her son is marvellously suitable nobody loves us neither thee nor me it is the fault of us both the chancellor prided himself on being a realist his admirers in germany applaud him for having had in the highest degree the sense of realities den wirklichkeitssinn but was not this realist rather a politician with short views he ignored in fact that violence and hate are not only sterile but also that sooner or later they turn against the brutal strength that used them the poles the schlesingers the alsace lorrainers who are none of them german in any way will never forego their resistance and their hostility the agreement born of the community of joys and sorrows the community of traditions and aspirations that is the cement which binds a nation force however brutal or powerful it is believed can never have but an ephemeral action bismarck denied having said might is above right in fact he did not say it how could he have said it according to bergson's words in his eyes right was simply what the stronger wills which is recorded by the victor in the law he imposes on the vanquished that was the whole moral philosophy of the country squire who became chancellor who under every circumstance of his political life was a man without scruple or pity here is a saying of his when i have an enemy i crush him the strong man had no doubt of the durability of his work nevertheless at times he felt a sort of horror of his own brutality one day at Vartzen, in october eighteen seventy seven he was sad and melancholy yet it was the time when his political work seemed at its apogee my soul is sad he said i have never in my long life made any one happy neither my friends nor my family nor myself i have done harm much harm it is i who am the cause of three great wars it is i who on the fields of battle have had eighty thousand men killed who to-day still are being mourned by their mothers their brothers their sisters their wives but all that is between me alone and god i never got any happiness out of it and to-day i feel my soul anxious and troubled over it without waiting for the judgment of god the french will never forgive bismarck the crimes he committed against them in eighteen seventy one after sadova he took nothing from austria because he wanted to be reconciled to her some day from us he took a piece of our flesh and so was willing that between his people and us there should be for ever a river of blood and hate the crown prince frederick had been able in eighteen seventy one to foresee the consequences of the violence done to alsace lorraine when he said france is now and will be for ever our natural enemy the present war has set face to face the two powers on one side the germany of bismarck and of william the second 
wholly imbued with the views of the chancellor the doctrines the manias of its emperor of its officers of its professors the powers of prey and death which dream of a world imperialism on the other france who with her noble allies fights for french alsace lorraine for the alsace lorrainers of rumania of serbia of poland of armenia for the liberation of belgium who fights in a word for right and liberty right and liberty these are factors unknown to bismarck's compatriots since germany was prussianized for france of the crusades and of the revolution those sacred words have a magic virtue in them there is a force that nothing can conquer a force superior to all injustices and all tyrannies all the bismarcks and all the kaisers in the world giants with feet of clay will not prevail against right and liberty as montalembert said of poland that alsace and lorraine of eastern europe which stands erect and confident through the most tragic catastrophes of history right lives in our hearts it lives in them like an inextinguishable flame it is at that flame that one day god will light the fire of his justice and his vengeance bismarck as we have seen wished to have inscribed on his tomb the proudly simple epitaph faithful servant of the emperor william i what does this mean in faithfully serving william i he served lying violence and robbery on the tombs of our children mowed down in the trenches hurled from the clouds perished in the waves we put this inscription servants of the right of honour of liberty history and the human conscience will always know where their admiration and gratitude are due of the dead man of friedrichsruh they will say that if he was a genius he was the genius of evil and that his work conceived in violence will perish in violence of the french and the allies killed since nineteen fourteen they will say that they were the avengers of morality the soldiers of humanity and that their glorious work will be crowned by the triumph of right End of section 12. Recording by Pamela Nagami in Encino, California, August 2016. End of Bismarck by Georges Lacour Gaillet. Translated by M. Harriet M. Capes.